very warm welcome on this lovely warm May evening to this the fourth in our series of Arable Horizon lectures. My name's Carl Schneider, I'm the editor of Farmers Weekly and on behalf of Farmers Weekly and Syngenta, welcome to tonight's event. Um, now the idea behind the Arable Horizons lectures is really straightforward. First of all, we identified the five areas of science and technology that we thought would have the biggest impact on agriculture, not over the next two or three years, but maybe over the next 10, 15, even 20 years. And then for each of those areas, we found leading researchers in the field to talk not just about their own work, but about how that area of scientific research or technology research could impact the way we farm over that sort of extended, over that extended time period. Um, we do those lectures in front of uh, an invited audience of farmers and other industry leaders from the world of agriculture, but the lectures are also streamed over the internet, so I don't know how many people are watching at home. Welcome to you all, wherever you are around the world. Um, and the video of the event is then captured and made available immediately after the event to be downloaded. So if you can't watch it live now, then you can download it later on at your leisure. And of course the results are all, uh, the, the video is also made available on the Farmers Weekly website on the, our YouTube channel and the results of tonight's lecture will be written up in I think in a couple of weeks time in Farmers Weekly. So I said this is the fourth in our series of Arable Horizon lectures. We've already had three excellent lectures. First one was on uh, genetics and uh, plant genetics and breeding. Uh, the second one was on soil science. Our third one just last month was on robotics and automation and tonight's lecture, well tonight the subject is biocontrols. So the use of, of living things, typically insects or microbes, to protect our crops from pests, diseases and weeds. Now this is a really exciting area of development. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have chosen it as one of our areas for arable horizons. And I think it's particularly important, given all the pressures we see on our more traditional routes to uh, protecting our crops. Uh, obviously there's you know, growing, growing regulation, uh, removing um, our, our access to, to, to many of the active ingredients that we've depended on in the past. There's the increasing challenge of, of resistance, of growing resistance to some of our, some of our the, the products that we use to protect our crops. Uh, and you know, it's just such an expensive and uh, uh, onerous business developing new products that the pipeline of new products isn't as uh, fat as it has been in the past. So I think there's never been a greater need to, to open up our arsenal of tools that are uh, at our disposal. So we're here in uh, the Rice Home campus, which is shared by um, the University of Lincoln and uh, Bishop Burton, uh, and it's a fantastic location. We're in a beautiful lecture, uh, beautiful conference centre here. I'm told that the buildings here date back to the 1700s, and there's been agriculture studied here since the 1960s. Um, I want to really, so, so I want to thank uh, University of Lincoln and Bishop Burton for hosting us. Uh, but I really want to thank Syngenta for sponsoring this whole series of lectures. Um, I think this is a really important series of lectures. I think, again, there's never been a more important time to bridge that gap between the world of academia about what's happening and, and could affect the future of farming and the farmers on the ground who are going to have to make these new, si this new science and technology work in the real world. So I think this is a, these lectures are actually really important. And this is a really expensive business. A huge amount of work has gone into putting these lectures together. You can see the technology around you. This doesn't come cheap, so we just couldn't do this without Syngenta. So big, big thank you to Syngenta. It just shows their commitment to the future of farming in this country. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to talk a bit about the, the way the lectures work. They're interact interactive lectures, um, so that interactivity takes a number of forms. Uh, first of all, uh, we're using a technology called Slido we have something up on the screen are we going to have something up on the screen about that so that is a way for you and not just you here in the room but you watching on the internet to submit questions for our Q&A session that's going to come after our first two main speakers so all you need to do if you've got a mobile phone and I encourage everyone in the room here to do this to go to www.slido.com and when you go there it's a very simple screen and it just asks you to enter a code and if you put in the code that's up there, I think you might just be able to see at the top, K604. If you put in that code, then that puts you in the right event. Don't put the wrong code in or you'll be asking questions to some completely different event somewhere else in the world. So that's one form of interactivity. 
A second one is this thing that looks like a big skittle I'm holding in my hand. This is a microphone ball. Um, you all must have been at events where you have that annoying sort of wait while a microphone gets passed around the audience to get to the person who wants to ask the next question or make the point. So the microphone ball cuts out all that nonsense. I'm going to hurl it at speakers. Uh, this is going to test your ability to catch. I'm going to do a quick demonstration. Uh, where's Adam? So Adam's going to demonstrate for me. If you look at the black bit on the ball here, when you, if, you're, if you're asking a question or you're speaking and you get the ball, just make sure you point the black bit towards your mouth. So I'll throw it to you like this. And hopefully you'll catch it just as Good well evening, as Adam Carl. did then. That's how it works. See? Simple. And so far, we haven't had a disaster yet on this. So, uh, maybe that's tempting fate a bit. And of course, thirdly, no event these days is, is without its Twitter hashtag. So the Twitter hashtag for Arable Horizons is hashtag Arable Horizons with an S at the end. Um, OK, you've not come here to hear me, so I'll st start by talking about tonight's speakers. We're very lucky to have two speakers for the main part of this evening's event. I'm going to introduce them one at a time as they come up to speak. Uh, and th they'll each speak for a, uh, uh, one after the other. And then we'll have a short break five minute, ten minute break, uh, a comfort break and for us to set up the stage, then we'll introduce the speakers back onto the stage and we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, and then at the end we have a third speaker, so to wrap up the whole event, um, we have Max Newbert from Syngenta who's going to tell us a bit about Syngenta's interest in biocontrol. So you've got a lot packed in tonight, I'm really excited about it. Okay, let's introduce our first speaker. Professor Simon Leather is Professor of Entomology in the Department of Crops and Environmental Sciences at Harper Adams University. I was very lucky to get a tour of their department last year. and They've got a fantastic new entomology uh, building. Uh, I think the paint's still wet on the building. Uh, so they've got fantastic facilities up there. Uh, Professor Leather also heads the new Centre for Integrated Pest Management at Harper Adams. And he's also the Director of Study on various research projects looking at UK biocontrol. Now, I'm going to describe, give the names of a couple of those projects. Don't ask me what exactly they mean, though. So one of the projects he's, he's, he's responsible for is tritro, tritrophic interactions in mixed vegetable crops and novel methods for the mass rearing of predatory mites of biological control in glasshouses. Um, he believes passionately in outreach. He regularly speaks at local schools, as well as uh, local history societies and other, other events. If you look on, the, on, on YouTube, you'll find several uh, videos of, uh, of uh, Professor Leather speaking. Uh, and he also blogs uh, at Don't Forget the Roundabouts. And he can be found on Twitter as at Entoprof. That's E-N-T-O-Prof, P-R-O-F. So I'm very pleased. And please give a warm welcome to Professor Simon Leather. much. It's hot. I will probably have to drink a lot of water. Okay, so uh, good evening everybody and uh, thank you to Farmers Weekly and Syngenta for uh, facilitating my presence here. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to actually be here on a sunny afternoon inside. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you about what next for biocontrol, but I decided I would change it slightly and talk about biological control in the broadest sense. And I'm going to really sort of sell this idea of what I think of as biorational pest management. And I'm also, because I don't think you can actually look at the future without having a good understanding of the past. So you're going to get a history lesson. I'm going to take us back thousands of years during the course of this talk before I project us uh, into the future. So modern agriculture is often blamed for all the problems we have. People are always saying it's farming has caused the pest problems. But actually, and th this is an example, people have been saying this for a long time. So this is John Stuart Collis um, complaining that uh, using tractors uh, has caused wireworms to become a big problem. But actually, it's not modern agriculture, it's agriculture itself that has caused the pest problems. So what we did when we invented agriculture was we bred plants to be palatable to us. And unfortunately, what's palatable to us is also palatable to pests and diseases. What we've done is we've taken the chemistry, reduced all the defenses, and made them nice and tasty so that we can eat them. Apart from cabbage, of course, which is still pretty dangerous if you're a kid. <coughs> you probably don't know, but uh, 
the stuff in cabbage is bad for your kidney and livers when you're a little kid. So your kids, when you force that cabbage on them or when you were a kid, you knew best. It's not good for you. Dad, why are you poisoning me? So anyway, farming has caused the pest problems, not modern farming, farming in general, agriculture. And we can have, we've got all this sort of stuff from the Bible, you know, there's plagues, locusts, and we have evidence from early crop protection. So there's a little thing there, the Bayeux Tapestry, there's a, a little boy there scaring birds off the crops. We've got an ancient Greek chasing birds with a sword. And of course, we've had scarecrows for time immemorial. So crop protection has been around a long time, but crop protection was very human-based. It was dependent on small boys with sticks, boys with stones, uh, wives going out and picking pests off vegetables, things like that. Uh, and of course, man's very ingenious, <clears throat> and people have tried very hard to come up with ways to protect their crops before we had a chemical arsenal. So this is a, an interesting device invented in America in the 1860s. Uh, the orchards uh, had a big pest with uh, weevils in plums and apricots. And uh, this ingenious device was supposed to irrigate your trees at the same time as you controlled your pests. Uh, ropes were attached to branches. You pressed the pump. It shook the weevils off. You caught them up, put them into a big pot and burnt them. Uh, and you can imagine this probably didn't work very well because you would need a lot of string, plus a lot of very strong people to move the pump handle. Uh, and if you look at the sort of things that were around, they were very physically based, uh, things like little hopperettes, uh, locust uh, mops, if you want to call them that, fly traps, sticky bands, so all sort of based on uh, catching your pest and then usually burning it. They seem to be very keen on burning the pests once they've caught them. Uh, this is another example. So this is, works a bit like a, a moat. So this was about chinch bug and uh, you basically dug a ditch in front of your crop as the invading pests have advanced, filled it with kerosene because this was an American device and as they fell in you then dropped a match in and burned them. So it was a very sort of um, hit and miss, very responsive uh, cr crop protection. <clears throat> I put this one in because humans had pests as well. Uh, so this is a, a rich Georgian lady and this is a flea control method and this is based on the, uh, the fact that fleas are very keen on warm areas where the blood is close to the surface and what the rich ladies did, they had a nice silver flea trap here, which was filled with flea bane, and you baited it and you stuck it into the warm place, and the fleas all were attracted to it and died. <clears throat> that was the theory. Um, I don't know how well it worked. Uh, there were some chemicals around. So the ancient Greeks knew that elemental sulfur was good uh, at killing fungi. So elemental sulfur has been used a long time. We still use it now. Uh, and of course, we had all these very broad spectrum, so broad spectrum they were more fatal to humans uh, than they were to the pests, so copper sulfate, arsenic, uh, tar oil, which of course and you end up with uh, Bordeaux mixture. Uh, so not that effective against the pest, but very effective if you wanted to uh, kill one of your relatives. Uh, so basically, as farmers, as horticulturalists, as uh, growers of all description, you had a very limited armory. So basically, you had to sort of rely on something else. And this is how biological control first came about. And biological control means different things to different people, which I'll explain a bit later. And it, it rose to prominence in the 1860s. And this was because the United States Department of Agriculture uh, were very far uh, sighted. They were looking into the future. They realized they didn't have anything really effective at controlling these pests that had come in with all their new crops. Uh, and the USDA at the time was staffed by a lot of English entomologists. Uh, and as a result of the lack of effective pesticides, they had to start looking at other things. And what these guys noticed, uh, and I should say actually that biological control is actually older than that. The Chinese, for example, used to... Um, move ant nests into their citrus orchards 
and then put bamboo poles between the trees to encourage the ants to move between trees to control the pests. The Bedouins uh, used to take ant nests to their oases so that the ants could protect the date palms. And Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's granddad, wrote in his day book uh, how he'd noticed that his cabbages in his garden were being attacked by cabbage white butterfly larvae, but also that the larvae were being attacked by parasitic wasps. And he hypothesized that this might be a good way of controlling things in the future. So back to the 1880s, uh, only the Americans came up with this idea that they had exotic pests attacking their crops. Where did the pests come from? And they went, worked out where the pests had come from, went to the countries where the pests had come from, and looked at what was eating the pests there. Brought them back, reared them up, released them. And very luckily, a number of these things worked. So the plum problem in Missouri, fixed by biocontrol. Uh, the citrus, citrus industry in uh, California, saved by a ladybird beetle and a parasitic fly, which ate the cottony cushion scale. Uh, Hawaii sugarcane industry, which was threatened by a weevil, solved by introducing a parasite. And same with the, the rhin rhinoceros beetle in Mauritius. So these things seem to be working really well, they became really popular because there wasn't anything else to do. So people were throwing biocontrol agents all over the place. Uh, and not all of them worked very well, but that's another story. Then we have, um, I should guess I just, before I move on with the history, this is what biological control is defined as. So although it had been around sort of scientifically for 100 years or so, we don't really get the classical biological control definition until the 1960s, about 100 years later. So basically, you're looking at parasites, predators, and pathogens which maintain your pest organism's density at a lower average than it would occur if they weren't there. And the, the important thing is that it's not eradicating. It's controlling. It's maintaining them at a lower pest population. And this is a theory. So you have your pest, your disease, whatever it is. It's operating above your economic injury level. You introduce your control organism. Again, could be any sort of biological agent. It hopefully reduces the population of your pest or disease, and it takes it down below the economic injury level, and all is well. So that's the theory. Uh, and that's what people were sort of working on up until the 1920s. And of course, in between 1914 and 1918, we had the Great War. And one of the great atrocities in the Great War was the use of chemical warfare. And what people noticed, certain people noticed that the human parasites were also killed by the chemical warfare. And that started the agrochemical industry, basically. Okay? So out of war came an agricultural boom. So we can then have the age of pesticides. We go through. Uh, a number of different uh, chemical classes, starting with the organochlorines, which the French first came up with in the 1920s, moving through the organophosphates, the carbamates, the pyrethroids, the insect growth regulators, the neonics. There's been this constant sort of development of pesticides. And these things were incredibly successful. They were easy to use. They were very, very effective. And those early organochlorines, DDT, were incredibly safe to us. The mammalian toxicity was incredibly low. There's some fantastic footage that you can find on the internet somewhere of a baseball stadium full of pregnant American women being sprayed with DDT to show how safe it was. My dad was a Marine in the Second World War. Once a week, they dragged them out from the bowels of the ship, lined them up on deck, and sprayed them with DDT. And there's nothing wrong with me. Uh, so. You know, it was very, very safe. The problem is, of course, that because it was so safe, because it was so effective, people used it all the time. And just like we have the problem with antibiotics, with the medics, we've got the problem with resistance. And basically, it's, it's why I always worry when I see that advert on telly, kills 99.9% .9 of known germs. What's about that other 0.1%? What are we producing? And this is, of course, what resistance is all about that natural enemies are not all equally, not natural enemies, pests are not all equally susceptible. They may escape by some way. They develop resistance. And pests are pests 
because of their pestiferous habits, their great ability to adapt and reproduce. And they are actually much better than natural enemies at surviving these sorts of things. So you end up with the resistance building up in the pest populations and the predators falling behind. And you end up with a resurgence. And we now know that there's more than 500 arthropod species that have already become resistant. And 200 weed species are resistant to herbicides. Some of this resistance has been around a long time. Housefly resistant to DDT since 1947. And the curve doesn't look very uh, encouraging. It's going up. Resistance is growing. Then we also have uh, the non-target organism. So it's not just the pests that are developing resistance. We are causing problems elsewhere with this overuse of the pesticides. So Rachel Carson drew to our attention in Silent Spring the fact that although these organochlorines were very safe for mammals, they were building up in the food chain. And we were ending up, uh, she was able to show us uh, the, the top, uh, top of the food web, the predators, the birds of prey, as they laid their eggs, breaking their eggs because the eggshells were so, so thin. If you were a cannibal in the 1960s and 1970s, you were in big trouble if you wanted to eat Americans because according to the FDA, Americans contained more organochlorine residues than you were allowed to have to be edible. So it was a big problem building up in the food chain. We also have, of course, the problem with our natural enemies, the collateral damage, and as is in the news all the time now about pollinators and how they too are affected by overuse of pesticides. So that leaves us with molecules disappearing, chemistry becoming harder to uh, get hold of. And remember, of course, that insects are very clever, that if they are become resistant to one uh, compound within a class, they tend to be able to become resistant across that whole, whole class of chemicals. So we can run out of chemicals very quickly. So biological control is probably where we ought to be looking at uh, very more, much more seriously than we are. So to go back to that heyday of the 1880s. And biological control is sort of divided up into different classes. There's classical, there's augmentation, there's conservation. And within augmentation, there's inundative and inoculative. I'm just going to quickly tell you what those are. So classical is the, what people came across first, which was you introduced an exotic organism to control an exotic pest. And the idea was that that, once introduced, it maintained itself and looked up, kept your pest problem down. Conservation biological control, which probably many of you use, but you may not call it conservation biological control, is where you modify the environment or you use your pesticides in such a way that you actually preserve your natural enemies or increase their numbers. So things like crop islands, things like conservation headlands can all be used in conservation biocontrol. Augmentation, uh, which is where you basically increase the numbers of natural enemies, uh, you either inundate your crop or you inoculate your crop with mass-reared natural enemies, which is one of the things that uh, we've been looking at uh, at Harper, for example. Uh, so inoculative, you release your mass-reared enemies to control a pest, and it's those natural enemies and their offspring that actually do the work. So that's been around in glass houses for a long time, and Rob, I'm sure, will talk all about it. Inundative is where you actually use the mass reared natural enemy to do the control. So almost like using it as a pesticide. You release the natural enemy, and it works there and then. Uh, and glass house control has been around a long, long time. So when I was a long-haired agric student, I can remember being taken to a glass house, big glass house uh, facility, quite small compared to what they have these days, uh, over near Hull. And the, the owner there telling us how pleased he was with his, in this case, trick of grammar, how it was controlling his pests and he wasn't having to use uh, chemicals. And of course, these days, it's come on a hell of a long way with sort of individual crop specific natural enemies. Uh, and for those of us who sort of work more out in the, in the field, in the arable landscape, the glass house sort of control is what is our holy grail. We would like to see the same levels of biological control that we can see working very successfully in glass houses working out on the farm landscape. 
And like the Holy Grail, it's probably an impossible ambition. But I think we can get some way to achieving it by looking at what we already have and then projecting forward how can we use what we have in imaginative and new ways. So, first of all, why use biological control? What's in it for you? Well, health, wealth, and happiness. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, some wise words from Thomas Jefferson, who points out that agriculture is actually really, really important. It might be ignored a lot, but it is something that produces real wealth. It's good for us as humans, and it produces happiness if we do it properly. So, that's one reason for using, well, three reasons for using biological control. If you look at biological control compared with traditional conventional pesticide use, biological control agents, biological control is a sort of way of crop protection, has a number of advantages compared with using chemicals. And I'm going through these uh, individually. So biological control agents are very selective. They can be pest specific. And they tend not to intensify your pest problem as you get with resistance and resurgence, uh, as chemical control can do. So they're very selective. Uh, this is a little bit of a red herring, but uh, we, it's always cited when you talk to students, you always tell them this is a good reason for biological control. The beneficial organisms are already there. So unlike new chemical molecules, you don't have to make them, you don't have to uh, put them together, they already exist, so you don't have a manufacturing process, which isn't strictly true. Um, they are able to locate their prey themselves, so they can seek out and find the pest organism. So you don't have to do a lot in ways of dispersal. You can release them. This is talking about whole organism biological, classical biological control, and the biocontrol agents go out there, they do the job for you. They're living organisms. And resistance, the pest species, finds it difficult to develop resistance to the biocontrol agent. Okay? Many of these early biocontrol agents were predators. And if you imagine you trying to develop resistance to a tiger, uh, that's the sort of resistance you'd have to develop if you were a pest, uh, an aphid being attacked by a ladybird. Okay? You'd have to develop armor plate very quickly. So in terms of resistance, they're probably pretty good, or not susceptible to it. And theoretically, once you've released them, they're self-perpetuating. They go out, they make new biocontrol agents for you. So that's sort of the advantages of the whole organism, the classical biological control approach. There are disadvantages of biological control. It's not totally perfect, of course. Control slow. These are biologicals. They're not knockdown sprays. It takes time for them to do what their job is. They also don't tend to exterminate the pest, unless uh, in glass houses you can get pretty good control like that. But out in the wider world, they're not going to kill all the pests. So it's not an exterminator. And out in glass houses, they've got it really sus. They can control their climate. Outside, weather is unpredictable. And a lot of these biocontrol agents are weather dependent. What's happening in terms of temperature, in terms of rainfall, can affect their efficiency. So they're not, at the moment, super predictable. And I said they're already present, so you don't have to manufacture them. Yes, you don't have to manufacture them, but you've got to rear them. So you've got to rear them in large quantities if you're doing inundative or inoculative biocontrol. So that is a manufacturing cost. And the early development and use requires expert supervision and research. You may have heard about the Japanese knotweed biocontrol uh, problem. That's been, we've had MSc students working with CAVI for 15 years trying to develop an effective biocontrol against Japanese knotweed. So it can take a long, long time. So those are thinking about the 
the, the biocontrol agents you can see. We do have another arm of biocontrol agents, the biopesticides, the microbials. And these are based on the diseases of your pest organisms. So they're the viruses, the fungi, the bacteria, and the nematodes, the things that in humans cause all sorts of nasty things, ranging from colds right through to instant death with uh, some of the viral infections. And they do the same things with insects. Some viruses and fungi only give the insects a bit of a, a twinge. Others, hopefully, are totally fatal. So these are the ones that uh, we, we think about using quite a lot because they are easier for us to control and they tend to be more compatible with our conventional control methods. They have a number of advantages. They don't leave any harmful residues for us. They are really, really highly specific. You can have strains of some of these microbials that will only attack particular species. They can be extremely host specific, so that you're not going to get collateral damage. With a little tweaking of formulations and little tweak of nozzles, you can pretty much use the same sort of technology that you use with conventional pesticides. They also work with conventional pesticides. The, uh, a lot of them aren't killed if you are using your chemical pesticides. Very hard for a pest to develop resistance to uh, a disease or a, an infection, and they are very non-toxic to mammals. So these are entomopathogenics, or they're herbi they're um, mycoses that affect plants. They don't affect mammals. Though that said, my dad, who was an agronomist, did manage to get aspergillus once, uh, which is quite a hard thing to do. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they do have disadvantages. They are slow acting because they're biological. They can be too specific. They can actually require a specific life stage in the pest's life cycle. And if the pest has grown past that life cycle, the microbial doesn't work. Because they're biological, they need a minimum pest population. A chemical pesticide, it doesn't matter how low the population of the pest is, if they get hit by the pesticide, they die. A microbial needs to build up. They can, because these are very fast breeding organisms, so you rear several hundreds of generations in the manufacturing process, if you're not careful, they can lose virulence, which is, means you're release something that isn't actually going to work. They do, in many cases, leave messy looking dead bodies. So the things that attack caterpillars leave a sort of squashed, uh, leaky caterpillar on the cabbages, for example, which your consumer might not want. It's all right maybe in forestry, but in cabbages, you've got to get rid of the, uh, the, the dead body. Again, climate is very important. A lot of these things won't germinate. They don't. Uh, spread properly unless they've got the right temperature, the right weather conditions. So you have some dispersal problems as well because they aren't entirely mobile, although some of them are very clever and cause behavioral changes in their hosts uh, so that they try to infect their friends and relatives. And of course, if you mention viruses and the outside world, the public, despite the fact you're telling them how safe they are, the public have real fears about viruses being released into the environment. Just a summary, biopesticides have a lot of advantages. They're less toxic. They generally only affect your target pest and closely related organisms. Effective in very small conditions, uh, con quantities. They often decompose quickly so you don't have a residue problem. They are difficult for the insect pests to develop resistance to. Disadvantages, slow, lack persistence because they uh, uh, they sort of um, break down very quickly, UV gets them, uh, and they aren't available easily. You've got to sort of search them out, hunt them down, and breed them. Chemical pesticides, on the other hand, very highly effective, easy to apply, low cost, one of the reasons why we use them so much. On the disadvantages, you're looking at broad spectrum, environmental persistence, non-target organisms, uh, secondary pests arising, and resistance and toxicity to us. So on balance, the biopesticides uh, have got more positives than the chemical pesticides, although their disadvantages are also uh, just as many, but not as serious. So what you want to do is not re rely entirely on biological control. I don't see biological control being 
perfect. I don't see it being something that you can use as your sole method of control. It's part of an integrated pest management uh, exercise. It's you use it with other things that are combat compatible or things that are going to work uh, uh, cheaply. So you can integrate, integrate a lot of your methods. You can think about application technology. You can think about partial plant resistance. Uh, you can think about how that lowers, makes the insects that are feeding on the plant more susceptible to pesticides, more susceptible to biocontrol. You don't need to use as much pesticide, so your biocontrol agents can, can work well. So you've got a, a virtuous circle here where you can combine application, uh, less persistent pesticides, biopesticides, partial plant resistance, and get a nice uh, integrated approach to control, not relying just solely on one method. And there's a whole pile of literature, much of which, of course, hasn't got uh, out to the public yet, even though some of it has been done uh, many years ago, ranging from relaxing your monoculture uh, to thinking about uh, a real, really diverse farming structure. And all these things that are up there, which are too many to read, are things that have been shown to work, at least in experimental uh, environments. And if we think about this as birational or biocultural, there are a lot of things that come out of it, not just the controlling your pest, but you've also got environmental and societal uh, benefits ranging from your crop right up to the landscape level. So things can look nicer if you're not uh, just using one crop and pesticides, for example. So it allows diversification. So in summary, You've got a lot of methods out there that you can use. And just because you use one doesn't mean you can't use the others. You can use them all together. Okay? And that sort of gives you your birational, your integrated pest management uh, approach. So what do I see the future holding for us? So I'm, I see the future of biological control or biocultural or biorational man pest management as being divided into sort of four different uh, areas. There's the plant itself. We know quite a lot now about what, how plants talk to us. There's the biopesticides, the microbials. And I've included, I'll go through uh, these in more detail. Then there's the, um, the sort of sophisticated technology which an earlier talk has talked about, the, uh, the, the really high-tech end of agriculture. And finally, and I'm only going to talk very briefly about this because we've already had one in the series, there is genetic engineering. So if we imagine our crop as a traditional huge monoculture, so this cabbage field is telling the world this is a cabbage field. It's a super cabbage. Okay. It's a huge visual signal to anything that likes cabbage, they can see it. It's also giving off a huge volatile perfume. And that is attracting all the things that love cabbage. The cabbage specialists can visualize this, they can see it, and they come into it. And we know a lot about the chemistry these days of, uh, of how pests perceive chemistry, which chemicals they respond to. Some of the work we've been doing at Harper Adams is, for example, uh, fixing uh, aphids up to electric circuits, passing chemicals over them, and seeing what they respond to. Okay? This has been around uh, a long time. You can stick little electrodes into aphids and see what they, what they like. Uh, so what you can do, thinking about intercropping, for example, is instead of having a wheat field, a bean field, and a cabbage field, and this is just a hypothetical combination, you put them together, and that, depending on how you sow them, how you uh, arrange them, and this could, of course, with ad advances in uh, sort of sophisticated uh, te cropping technology, uh, you could arrange them all sorts of different ways. You could end up with, instead of a cabbage smell, a wheat smell, and a bean smell, you could end up with a melange. And that melange totally confuses the pests, they don't know what they're looking at, they don't know what they're smelling, they don't land in your crop. And that's something that we're uh, really interested in uh, developing. 
And we also know from uh, some molecular work looking at volatiles that what you grow next to a crop can actually tell your crop plant to do something different. So in this case, this is uh, work that showed that by planting uh, alliums, onions, next to, uh, in this case, the beans, uh, that it made the beans give off an anti-aphid uh, smell. So that's something you could possibly think about. How, how, does this, how can you grow things in combination that scare away your pests? And we know, we've known for quite a long time now, uh, that plants talk to each other. People laughed at this when it first came up in the 1970s, but we know now how it works. And plants tell each other if they're being attacked. They'll tell their friends and relatives, something's biting me, something's infecting me. And that tells the rest of the plants to get ready to be attacked, to develop resistance, to become uh, hard and tough. So that's something else we could think about. How do we get plants to prime themselves and be res resistant to the pests rather than the pests being resistant to your control methods? So what we're envisaging at Harper, and this is something we're uh, in the process of developing, is the idea of an electronic nose. And this nose, not only can it smell the plants, but it can smell whether the plants have been attacked by a pest or a disease. And our hope is that we will be able to find specific smells coming off the plants that will tell you what pest or disease has actually attacked that plant. So you can use the smell to say, right, this plant has been attacked by a, a specific aphid or it's got a specific disease on. And then envisaging the advanced technology, the robotics that are out there, we have the electronic nose is fixed to some sort of drone or some uh, harvesting, sewing, whatever machine you want to think about it, that's robotically operated. It's out in the field, it's sniffing, it says, aha, this is attacked by an aphid, and it either puts a chemical pesticide on, because you could use your, your chemical pesticide still, or it could put a biopesticide, deliver it direct to the infected plant. So that's something we're looking at. At the moment, we're just uh, identifying the smells, and we know people are working on technology that can maybe apply it. So that's something uh, that would be really neat if we could get that uh, to actually work in the field. Other biological controls are the pheromones. So using the sex pheromones, the aggregation pheromones, that, in this case, insects, give off to attract uh, their mates. We can use pheromones for monitoring. We've used pheromones for monitoring for a long time to tell people when they need to spray. At uh, Harper, we've just uh, developed a new pheromone lure for saddle gall midge, which is much more effective than the current monitoring method. You can use pheromones to disrupt mating. You can make the insects get really confused so they don't find the females. So you reduce the populations that way without actually putting anything on your crop at all. Or, and this is again something we're developing at Harper, uh, my colleague Tom Pope has been looking at the, using an aggregation chemical that attracts the pests towards a killing jar, basically. So rather than you applying pesticide to your crop, you draw the pest to your pesticide. The pest kills itself. And if you're using a biopesticide, you can attract the pest to the biopesticide, it's infected, and then it goes away and it infects its friends and relatives. So you don't need to actually put any pesticide, either a biopesticide or a conventional pesticide, into your crop. The insect, in this case, comes towards its own killing jar. So that's another uh, really good way of keeping chemicals away from your crop. And this has got some uh, commercial applications already. Ex-student of mine working in Germany uh, is marketing this product here, which is a, uh, an attractant with it's a granular formulation. It has a fungus in that kills wireworm larvae, and they're attracted, and they sort of come along, and they ingest uh, the poison. So that's something that's already out there. And of course, there's botanicals. These are used quite widely in horticulture, all sorts of botanicals, all sorts of chemistry that's coming, natural chemistry coming out of plants. Uh, works really well. It's really compatible. You can use the same nozzles. You you know, to use the same machinery. Uh, 
and it works well in protected crops. We're looking to s take this out into the field. Uh, we've asked AHDB for funding to do this, but they didn't fund us. So if anybody out there has got some money and they'd like to fund us uh, to look at actually using botanicals out in the field in an arable situation, we'd be very happy uh, to speak to you. Uh, I'm very conscious that I've been talking about insects, but I am an entomologist. But biocontrols do exist for other uh, pests and diseases. So here's Fargrove's um, selection of uh, fungal biocontrol agents against fungal diseases. Again, mainly uh, glass houses. This is Aflasafe, which uh, controls the fungi that uh, cause aflatoxin in cereals. This is used in Africa, out in the field. Not here yet, but it means it's available for development. Mycoherbicides, so fungi that kill weeds, they've been around a long time, as you can tell by the black and white uh, picture here. Uh, so in the States, you've been able to use mycoherbicides against uh, weeds in uh, rice and soybean, for example, for a long time. So there are out there already some of these products. Not strictly biological, but again, uh, non-chemical is the idea of laser weeding. You have a technology, you have a machine, a sensor that can recognize a weed species. Uh, the one we have at Harper, I think, can do 26 species now. Uh, and the idea is that it will, again, however you use the technology, whether it's going to be a big machine or a grid thing or a little drone, it finds the weed and it lasers it, takes out the growing point. The one that looks like a bicycle is in the States, and the futuristic one uh, is how we envisage it might work at, uh, at Harper. Uh, so that's the engineering department working with uh, John Reed, who's our weed scientist. Uh, and we've also been looking at developing this to control slugs. Uh, you can attack slugs with lasers. They don't like it up. Uh, weed control, planting patterns. You don't need to plant in a grid. If you've got this technology, the harvesting technology, the robotics, you can do precision planting, you can do precision harvesting. This is work uh, from 16 years ago in Denmark that showed that you could increase uh, your sowing density, plant in a different way, and increase your yield and control your weeds. And I was pleased to see that it's now actually being used. So this is uh, from Farmers Weekly, where else? Uh, this is an example of uh, something developed by scientists that's actually finally made it to agriculture. It's taken 16 years. Uh, we ought to be doing better. We should be getting these things out there faster. We should be communicating to farmers and growers uh, in a much more timely fashion. But it's good to see, here it is, something that people would have laughed at in the past. Here's somebody sowing something differently and getting weed control. Uh, and then finally, there's the, the genetics, the genetic engineering. So CRISPR, we've mentioned, uh, Carl mentioned it. It's an editing tool. Basically, it sort of works like a pair of scissors and you put a mutation in uh, where you want. Uh, we've used mutagenesis in plant breeding for 100 years, usually either radiation or chemistry. This is much more direct, it's much more effective. You get the results you want, or at least you get the molecule, uh, you get the DNA change that you want. It might not always give you the result you want. So this is, uh, again, from Farmers Weekly. So this was a GM wheat trial, and some of you may remember this. The scientists at Rothamsted uh, engineered wheat so that it gave off alarm pheromone, the idea being that the aphids wouldn't land because they would be scared by the wheat. If they'd come and asked us at Harper, is this a good idea, we would have told them, no, it ain't going to work. So those of you, why, why didn't it work? Anybody know why it didn't work? Any suggestions? Okay. Who lives on a farm? Do you smell it? Right. You habituate. I work at Harper. I don't smell Harper unless the wind changes direction and you turn your nose on. And basically, because this pheromone was coming out all the time, the aphids just, like we ignore motorway signs because we know that says it happened, like, you know, there's, it's, there's an accident. You know, actually, it happened yesterday and they haven't turned the sign off. We habituate to these things because it's there all the time. And that's exactly what the aphids did. If they had a gene that turned it on only when the aphid landed, then it would have worked. So then the chemists needed to talk to the biologists. So, and there are some ethical considerations with biocontrol agents, uh, particularly GM, introducing non-native species, non-target effects, 
things like who decides what's ethical and who pays for it. Who's going to pay for all the development? Is it going to be industry? Is it going to be levy boards? Is it going to be government? Uh, it's not cheap. It's like the chemical industry. So there are risks and ethics in biological control. Okay? And I can envisage sort of looking forward into the future, two sorts of future. And these two sort of crop habitats, uh, farming landscapes, are, I think, our choices. We could go for a highly automated robotic agriculture using highly pre precision directed pest control, either using electronic noses, using uh, visual uh, laser beams, things that can detect the pests, using GPS technology so that you can direct your, you could even use your chemicals because you'd be so um, precise, but I would like to see it as a biopesticide based uh, exercise that you're directing very specific biopesticides to the crop plant rather than the whole crop, the plant, crop plants that need it. So you've got your GPS, it tells you where your nutrients are required, it tells you where your pest control is needed, it recognizes what pest or weed you've got there and it controls it and it can all be done robotically and you could go for a big landscape. Probably not what I would uh, prefer. I would probably prefer something again robotic based with drone sensors, electronic sensors, uh, using biopesticides or again very precise chemical applications and because it's so precise because you've got uh, ingenious harvesting machines that don't need large fields that can sort of get in there and we've seen uh, people developing robot uh, apple pickers why not have a, a, a robot uh, carrot that can get into corners so that you can use your conservation biological control because you're not using uh, conventional pesticides you're using biopesticides so you've got a pretty much chemical free environment uh, and a very diverse landscape because you're using sort of highly advanced technology. So we could either go two ways, and I guess it's going to depend on how many people there are and how, how much food we're going to need to produce, whether we can go for, whether we have to go for a sort of factory, but biologically based factory farming, as it were, intensive farming, or we can go for a nice landscape and still grow high yielding varieties, but in a much more diverse uh, way. Right, so that's me done. You can, take, you can take a seat for a moment. Thank you very much, Professor Simon Leather. Um, before I introduce our second speaker, my head's spinning thinking about all the things that we just went through. I was desperately trying to tweet some of the things. I got through about 5%, I think, of the things he covered in that lecture. Um, before I introduce our second speaker, I, said, I mentioned earlier on that we're using some technology called Slido. And I said that you can use it to ask questions. So um, please do submit your questions. You can do it at any point during the evening, and we'll be reviewing the questions. Um, and then ask, we won't be able to ask all of them, but asking some of them in the Q&A session in a, in a moment. When, if you do ask a question, can I ask you to please, especially if you're in the room here, put your name on the question, and then rather than me just parroting it, we'll get you to put your question directly to our speakers, and I'll throw that green uh, ball at you to ask your question directly. So please put your name on it. Uh, but the technology, as well as allowing us to answer questions, also allows us to run polls. So we're going to try our first poll of the evening. Now I'm going to tweak the wording slightly. So the wording there in front of you, so don't answer it yet, hold on. Uh, the wording there says, do you understand what is meant by the term biopesticides? Now of course, having just heard uh, that lecture, we now all know what a biopesticide is. So I'm going to reinterpret the wording to say, before tonight's lecture, before you heard Professor Leather speak, did you know what a biopesticide was? So here's your chance to play with uh, Slido. So take your phone out. Um, if you haven't already registered on Slido, do and um, give your answer to that question. Um, so, so far it looks like we're talking to a very, um, a fairly expert audience. Uh, in the, it's in people in the room and watching on the internet who can answer this. Uh, we'll, we'll let that clock up and we'll come back to it later on. We'll have a couple more polls uh, later on in the evening. Um, and do ask your questions, put your questions onto Slido and we'll come back to that later on.